want to thank you for joining us again on Wednesday uh, Bible Studies. Tonight we're going to be studying the last book of Romans, Romans 16. And this particular part is personal greetings from all to those in Rome. And we're going to find a couple other things in there that's quite interesting. So with that, before we do anything, we need to go to the Lord in prayer. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity that we can serve you in this way, that we can study your word by way of uh, communications, of electronics. We thank you, Lord, that we have a pastor that understands how to do these things, and we know that eventually we will be able to return and have fellowship again. But until then, Lord, we, we uh, honor you this way, and we uh, search your word. We are challenged at times and we thank you even for that Lord it causes us to dig a little deeper to think a little harder to love a little more and Lord as we come to you tonight we ask for your blessings we ask for the Holy Spirit to be with me and to be with those who are listening and uh, Lord we will offer all the glory honor and praise to you in Jesus name Amen <clears throat> Now, as I did last week, uh, I want to do a, a kind of the same pr uh, following, is to read uh, several verses and then follow up with uh, verse by verse. I think it keeps the continuity a little better, and um, it's easier for me to follow because my eyesight's not all that good. So, uh, another one little ca caveat I want to add here is that as I read especially the names uh, of the people of of, uh, which Paul is going to be talking about here. If I stammer a little bit, it's because some of these names are hard to pronounce. And um, if you want a real, real hard ones, go back to the Old Testament, and it looks like you're reading alphabet soup. But here, uh, forgive me if I, if I uh, stammer on some of them, but you'll understand why. So what I'd like to do uh, right now is to read uh, from... Uh, 16 to uh, 1 through uh, verse 16, 1 through 16, and then we'll go back and discuss who these people are. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles. It's Romans chapter 16, verse 1. And this is Paul. I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in in Crea, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you, for that she has been a great help to many people, including me. And three, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junus, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Meet uh, Ampli uh, Ampliatus, whom I love in the Lord. Meet a great uh, Urbanus, a fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachus. Greet Apollos, attested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong in the household of Astrobolus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. And twelve. Greet uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa, those women who worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Thirteen. Greet Rufus chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me, too. 
um, and then we go down to 14, and greet uh, Asentocritus, I think that's how it's pronounced, and Aflagon, Hermes, uh, Atrobus, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Greet, uh, greet Philologus, Julia, Julia, or Julia, uh, Ner, uh, Neres, and his sisters, and uh, Olympus, and all the saints with him. Greet one another with a holy kiss, and, and it says finally here, all the churches of Christ send greetings. Sorry for the butchering of the names, but uh, it doesn't roll off the tongue that easy. So, anyway, let's go back and start looking at who these people are and, and review them a little bit. And we'll go back to verses 1 and 2. And here Paul says, I commend, uh, commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Uh, I ask you to reserve her in the Lord in a worthy way of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been great help to many people, including me. Now, we really don't know a whole lot about Phoebe, who she was, but we, we do realize, or we think anyway, that she was a very wealthy businesswoman. And we have no reason to know why she was going to Rome other than she was going to Rome. And uh, she was a servant in the, the, the church in uh, Corinth, I believe. But St. Crea is a seaport, and the seaport here is about seven miles east of Corinth. And we know that uh, Paul had spent uh, a, a lot of time, a considerable amount of time in Corinth, and now uh, this seaport is one that he used while he was on his, I think, his second missionary journey. But here we see Phoebe, and she is hand-carrying this letter. And uh, the purpose, of course, is to take that letter to the church in Rome. And as we see that, it tells us a lot. Uh, it tells us a lot, really, especially as we read these next few verses of where the women were an integral part in the development of the church. Um, we, we know that there was really, as far as a male system like we have today, there really wasn't one for the common man. Um, the Romans had uh, couriers that would often carry uh, uh, letters and, and uh, various things back and forth, but that was uh, their system. The common person really didn't have any type of mail system, and so they had to go by happenstance of who was going to what particular area they, they were to be uh, sailing to and give them whatever articles or letters that uh, needed to be moved from one place to the next. And oftentimes they would pay that person a, a little extra money to carry these thoughts. And so this is not any different. Uh, we see that that uh, Phoebe is going to be the person who is carrying it. And w one of the reasons why she is mentioned first is that this is a letter of in introduction to her, of her to the church there. And perhaps <clears throat> it's one of the saying is that help her in any way that you can. I don't know if this is her first time to Rome or not. Perhaps she needed escorts to go throughout Rome. Rome was a pretty large city compared to other cities. And perhaps she was uh, there to visit relatives or what. We really don't know. But we do know this, is that she was a servant, and she was a worthy servant, and Paul thought highly of her. And so he hands her this letter, and he says, please take this to Rome, and when you're there, give it to the church. And she dutifully did so. But what does this tell us? as we continue to read this, is that, again, women had a very important uh, part in the development of the church. And we're going to see that as we read these names. Uh, there's several ladies, women's names, are mentioned. And that brings up uh, verse 3 and 4. It says here, greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now, what's unusual here 
is that the lady name is mentioned first. Generally, it is Aquila, the man, and Priscilla. Now, th these are two married, a married couple who are missionaries in their own right. And at the time here, they are in Rome. Uh, and saying, Paul is saying, here, greet them. But there was a time when uh, Aquila and Priscilla did live in Rome, and in about 80, 50, 51, right in there, the, um, uh, the leader of the Caesar had uh, kicked out the Jews and the Gentiles and told them to leave because there was, they were causing uh, upright, uh, upright uh, not that, but rioting and uh, uprising uh, amongst themselves. There were Christians that were going into the synagogues uh, preaching and teaching Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The Jews did not believe it, and so they became uh, rioting. And so the Caesar at the time says, had enough of this, all Jews, all Gentiles are to leave. And Aquila and Priscilla, in this case, left, went to Corinth, lived there, and now the this moratorium of, about Jews and Gentiles has been lifted. They are now living back in Rome. And perhaps uh, a lot of information that uh, Paul has received about the Roman Christians was given to them by Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, so he is then giving them the second introduction of greetings. And by placing Priscilla first is telling you how significant she was in the development of the missionary work. And it goes on and says here, they risked their lives for me. Well, while living in Corinth, uh, Paul lived with them for quite a while, and they became very, very close friends. And it says, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. And it goes on and says here, greet also the church that meets in their house. That's uh, part of it verse 5. Well, back then, of course, we didn't have the churches. Like then they had synagogues. Well, the Christian churches, there were none. And so what they did is they met in individuals' homes. And this is nothing unusual back then. It's not really unusual now when we see small churches as they start to develop. Sometimes they meet in people's garages. I know of one church that started in meeting in garage, then they start, They actually got larger and larger. They could uh, uh, rent a building. Some of them would rent schools, things of that nature. And then by the time they had enough money to build their own churches, well, this is pretty much how it is here. They met in people's homes. And so that uh, throughout the first century and actually first couple of centuries, that's how the churches developed. Then we go on down uh, to the second part of 5, and it says, Greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Now, we don't really know a whole lot about Eponidas, but we do have this one little caveat there, and I think it's a tremendous mark for him, is that he was the very first convert to Christ in Asia, uh, I couldn't find a whole lot about him, but that to me is very significant uh, to be first of, you know, and it's very exciting to see that here he is, he's, he, he was living in Asia, of course, at that time. Now he's living in Rome, and Paul is saying, hey, uh, my greetings to him, too. And, um, and if you have one of these trivia questions, who was the first uh, convert to Christ in Asia? The answer, of course, is uh, here. And it would be Eponidas. Now, we go on down to 6. It says, meet a uh, greet Mary, who would work very hard for you. Now, we don't know who this Mary is. Mary is a very common name. Um, have no idea who it is. But as we look here, it says, work very hard for you. If we look at that, it means working to the point of exhaustion. Uh, this lady was so committed to what she was doing that she was working literally her fingers to the bone. 
and she's working very hard uh, for the Lord. And that's again, is very commendable. And here again is another woman being mentioned. And then in 7, it says, uh, Greet Andronicus and Junus, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they, are in Christ, and they were in Christ before I was. Well, here again is a working couple, a married couple, uh, working to the point where it has actually brought the attention of the apostles. They're saying, look at the work that they have done. Uh, it's commendable. Let's keep our eye on them. But again, as we look at this, we see another lady's name mentioned. And as we look through this, uh, again, it just brings out the point that I'm making is that the development of the church was uh, very essential with the women involved. We go on down. Um, Oh, and my relatives. Now, some of your Bible's manuscripts might say Kingsman. And I think that actually is a better translation. Kingsman uh, is um, uh, of the tribe that, that uh, Paul was from. We do know that Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So when he says, these are my relatives or my Kingsman, we know that he's speaking of the tribe of Benjamin. Then we have uh, eight. Oh, and, of course, they were Christians before Paul. Um, you know, Paul became a Christian, uh, well, converted on the Damascus Road. We know that. And there were those that had to service him before he became a Christian. So uh, when he sees that, he's thinking, wow, they were Christians before me. Um, and he can realize that the Christian movement was way before him, his, his calling was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, then in 8, it says, Greet uh, um, Ampliatus, whom I loved in the Lord. Now, we don't really know who Ampliatus is. Um, we do know that he is loved, and he is loved by Paul. And in 9, uh, Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend, Stasis. Um, again, he's saying, my dear friends, we don't know a whole lot about them, so um, the research stays pretty much there. I'm sure if we could dig a little more, if we wanted to, to look into church history, we could find, but um, right now, it's just, this is a brief overlay, so we can kind of get an idea of who Paul is, is talking, or greeting, or sending his greetings to. And Pellas is verse 10, as we look there, uh, attested and approved in Christ. How would, how would you like to have your name in a manuscript's Bible, but any manuscripts that is uh, for the Lord, you said, this is, and put your name there, tested and approved by, by the Lord. I think that speaks high volumes for this particular person. And it, it speaks high volumes for all of those who are approved by Paul. Um, he doesn't say those words lightly. Uh, Astrobolus, that says in verse 10, uh, uh, no, yeah, and uh, those who belong to the household of Astrobolus. Now, here, it, this one, I did research a little bit, and this is tradition, though, and tradition says that Astrobolus was the brother of uh, Barnabas. And we know who Barnabas is. He was a traveling companion of uh, the Apostle Paul. And um, he was that one who would come alongside, as we've discussed in the past, that would be that encourager. Well, tradition shows us that this is Barnabas's brother. And it also says that uh, he was ordained as a bishop by Paul and Barnabas and um, he, um, we don't have any supporting evidence to show that, but these are the traditions that are carried forth. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. It's just interesting. As we start looking at these names, they're just not just names, they're people. And uh, I, I like that because to me it brings the scriptures uh, more alive. 
uh, verse 11, it says, Greet uh, Herodian, my relative. Now again, mine, mine says relatives. I know other manuscripts will say Kingsman, and I do believe that those are um, better translations. But this person is uh, possibly from the same tribe, we, as we said, of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, Narcissus is mentioned here. We really don't know who that is, but he is a friend of Paul's. That's verse 11. Um, or go to verse 11. Yes, uh, and in verse 12, it says, Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, those who work hard in the Lord. Again, when he says that, it's meaning you're working to the point of exhaustion. That's really what that means. And greet uh, my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Now, here's three ladies. Um, uh, the first two, Tryphena and Tryphosa, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the um, um, word itself and what they're translated to, Tryphosa means uh, dainty and Tryphena, uh, I'm sorry, Tryphena means dainty and Tryphosa means delicate. It's um, quite possible that they were sisters and maybe even twins. So we, we see that um, two ladies are mentioned. Then we have that third one there. Uh, Persis is another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Um, that, again, it's just showing us that women work very hard for the church and the development of the church. We go down to 13. It says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Now, Rufus <laughs> means red hair. So he's probably a redhead. And, uh, but the other part here, he says, and his mother. Now, I don't know about you. I mean, uh, I've had several uh, of my grandchildren's friends Call me Grandpa. Um, it's because I have known them for, well, almost all their lives. And they call me Gramps or Grandpa. Uh, I even have a couple, three, that even call me Dad. Uh, because it's, that, it's an honor uh, that they're bestowing upon me. And uh, as we see here, he's saying, and Mother, who's been like a mother to me. So he's, he's actually giving her the honor of saying, she is like a mom to me. And when I see the kids, my grandkids, friends call me Gramps or Grandpa, and a couple, three of them, like Lacey and my daughter-in-law and others who would call me Dad, it, it's an honor that bestows upon me is that they look upon me as a father figure. And here Paul is saying is that, Mom, she treated me like my mom. And I don't think that that's any better than that. It's like you're, you're part of my family, and come on in, my home. My home is your home. And, and he's giving her honor there by saying she was like a mom to me. Um, verse 14, uh, um, greet a, a cynic. Uh, this one is killer. Um, a a centritus. No, I'll get it in a minute. A cent. Protest, that's how it's pronounced, and Flagon. Um, we don't know a whole lot about them. We sure know about their names, hard to say. So well, that's enough. And then we see Hermes, Trobus, Hermas, and the brothers with them. Now what's interesting here, if we look at um, the, the names like Hermes and Hermas, these are names of Greek gods, little g of course, and we see that... Um, Hermes, his uh, name is the god of commerce. And if we look at Hermas, that's the god of, which would be Mercury. And it's telling us that here we have some Greek names in here too. Uh, Roman names, Greek names, Jewish names, and all. And we'll get to that in just a moment. And then as we drop down uh, to 15, uh, Ologus and Julia, uh, uh, Nerf, uh, Nerf no, for, uh, I get it here in a second. Nerfus, that's him. Okay, and, and his sister, 
and Olympus and all the names and the saints with them. Uh, not a whole lot known about them other than being mentioned and, and greet them. So we know that they're dear friends to um, Paul. Then we get on down and uh, it says, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, that's quite common then. And, and in certain countries of Europe, greeting each other with a kiss was is common. Uh, I know in my father-in-law's side, um, when he remarried, he remarried into an Italian family, and they greeted each other with a kiss. And I thought, well, that's kind of kind of strange. But if you don't um, look at it that way, I don't anyway. I just, well, that's the way they greeted each other. And it was usually a peck on the cheek. And he's saying, meet, greet each other with a holy kiss. And I'm thinking, well, that's a you know, kiss on the cheek. Um, it's not like that kiss of death of Judas where that was the kiss of death. When he kissed Jesus on the cheek, it was supposed to be like a holy kiss, and, and it wasn't. And uh, that, that, that is sad because he was using something that was very traditional and that meant something very worthy and betrayed it. Uh, but here, greet each other with a holy kiss. And then it says all the churches of Christ send greetings. Have you ever wondered how church names develop? Uh, when I grew up, I belonged to the Church of Christ. Well, we can see that oftentimes the names of these different churches come uh, from verses like this, Church of God, Assembly of God, of those um, churches of Christ. Well, when I was uh, a teenager, it, it was a Church of Christ, and we had a to change her name, and I've told you the reason why, because uh, people would come from the South, and if it was Church of Christ, instrumental, Church of Christ, non-instrumental, people would walk in and see a, a piano or organ or uh, different uh, various, uh, various uh, items of musical instruments, and they thought that uh, that was bad, because we were not supposed to have those in their churches. So we changed our name, and we called it uh, the Christian Church, and uh, Central Christian Church. We kept the CCC, and we developed seven other churches after that. We were the mother church, and we developed seven more churches in addition to that. But uh, church names are kind of interesting in how they get their names and how we came about uh, Churches of Christ. I'm going to think that it goes back to verses like this. Now, the question um, of these greetings and if you look at it, and this is what I thought was interesting, is it went to Romans, it went to Greeks, it went to Jews, it went to Gentiles, it went to men, and it went to women, women and prisoners and prominent citizens like Phoebe itself. And it crossed the cultural, social, economic lines as the church had grown, and they came together in one accord. This was the development of the church. They were unified. It didn't make any difference wh who you were. It didn't make any difference what color of your skin. It didn't make any difference if you were poor, if you were rich, if you were Jew or Gentile. They came together as one. And that's the way the churches should be. We come together as one. We don't look at the ethnicity. We don't look at uh, how a person is dressed. We greet each other. Oftentimes, uh, I'm the greeter, uh, and many times in, in our church here. And I, I want to make sure that we make eye contact, that we have that friendliness about it, that, hey, brother, hey, sister, welcome to the church. Welcome to God's house. And that is the way, to me, is that first impression that's made. Um, I've said before is that I've been to many, many churches throughout the United States, and when I go to one that's very cold, uh, that's a lasting impression. I said before that that was a stumbling block for me because I, I just couldn't get beyond that. And so I'd, I would find a church that was a little more friendly than that. And um, really does, doesn't make it a better church, but it certainly does have a lasting impression. So we see that, and uh, it, it puts an emphasis again on who Paul is greeting. Many of them, if you, I not put a pencil to it, but many of them were women. And it tells us, again, the prominence, how 
women were a, an essential part of the development of the church during the first century. Okay, now, we see here is, is that we're going to drop down now to verses 16, and we're going to read down to um, 23, and we'll see here is that Paul's greetings have, uh, are complete. Uh, he's, but here, and we're going to see, he's going to add a postscript, like a PS to it, in which uh, he warns against the, uh, those who would dis disrupt the unity of the church. And this group really is not identified, except that they are servants of their own appetites. And to me, what that's saying is, who is getting the glory? Uh, is it the person who is speaking, this smooth talker, and is it all about him or her? Um, or is it the glory going to the proper place? The glory should go always to God. So let's read that and keep that in mind. 17. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who, uh, whose, uh, cause, who cause di uh, diversions and put obstacles in your way that they are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them. 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Every, uh, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our God, Lord uh, Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you. So do Lucius, Jason, uh, Susepiter, and, and my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down these letters, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality uh, I and the whole church, church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Rastus, who is the city director of public works, and our brother Cortes send you their greetings. So, have you noticed a difference here between the greetings from 1 through 16, and now we see the greetings from 21 through 23, actually, 24, we're going to discuss in just a minute. The difference here now is these greetings um, are from a different person, and I'll tell you in just a moment why. Uh, when we see a scribe, often we, they're secretaries, when they're writing for an individual, like in this case for Paul, Paul's all, eyesight was bad, and uh, so he, he needs someone else to write for him. Um, quite often at the end of the letter or the epistle, what they were called, would also add their caveat there of sending their personal greetings uh, to the recipient of the letter. And this is nothing different than that. And in fact, uh, we see that the scribe, the secretary, uh, even names himself. And he says, I'm writing this for Paul. And he is saying, he's also saying, these other people are giving you the greetings also. So with that, let's look at um, these people. Who are they? And yeah, I want to start no, back to 17 through 20, though, and then we'll discuss who the people are. Um, 17 through 20, these verses are a bit more, a, a bit more of teaching, but, in, but they're not the type of teaching that Paul has been giving up to this point. This is more of a warning, and he's saying, be cautious, be, uh, be on alert for people who are smooth talkers, who are trying to teach you falsehoods. You know what you have been taught, and, and the churches have been taught, and whatever they say, be, be sure and compare what they are telling you and what you are hearing to what has been, you've learned in the past. Um, Paul is very aware of how people can turn things around. We know in, uh, in Berea, 
Paul would be teaching or preaching the word, and the Bereans would go home at night or in the afternoon, whenever they dispersed, and would check what Paul was saying to the scriptures. And Paul would say, be like the Bereans. Don't just take my word for it. Take the scriptures' word for it. And he's saying pretty much the same thing here. Say, don't take these smooth talkers and believe in them. You know, sometimes we're swayed by somebody that can give you a, a tremendous speech, and it sounds wonderful, but underlining it is something that's obviously wrong. And so we're saying, don't pay attention. Well, yeah, pay attention, but don't be, uh, d don't be swayed by a smooth talker. Uh, I always relate that to so like a patent leather salesman, man. They'll tell you anything, a uh, patent leather shoe salesman. They'll tell you anything to get you to buy something. Uh, and here, these people, and, and I, he, he doesn't even really mention who they are because he doesn't want to help develop what they're teaching. But uh, agnostics and things of that nature back then was very common. And so he's saying, be very careful. Pay attention to what they're saying. Check what they're saying. Compare it to the rest of the churches. What have the, uh, what have the missionaries been teaching you? How does it fa uh, fall with Christ as being Lord and, uh, of, and um, the Savior of uh, mankind? How does it fall there? Uh, what are they telling you? And if it's anything different, be leery of these people. And so he's saying this in the form of a warning. And it is lesson, but he's also complimenting them too, as he did in verse and chapter 15. He says, but I know that you uh, are, are educated. I know that you're smart. I know that you're capable of teaching. He says, but there are those who are naive, may not. And it's just like a new or a baby Christian coming in to uh, into, uh, Christianity are very susceptible and they're hearing uh, different types of messages. Some are very smooth talkers. And I don't want to get into TV ministries, but oftentimes you'll find that some of these TV ministries are very uh, hurtful. And so as we educate people, especially our new Christian, uh, and through Bible studies and by word of mouth, things of that nature, is to have them know what the Bible says and not what just somebody says. And that's what I believe Paul is say, saying here. Be leery of them, especially the naive, those who are baby Christians. Be uh, cautious of their words. And if it's not glorifying God and it's glorifying them, then you know something is wrong. Uh, I often think of how um, the cults uh, get to, to the point where like, Jim Jones, what that man could say persuaded so many people to follow him and then to take this, the poison pill uh, to death is beyond my thinking. But it happens, and that's why it's leery. That's why it's cautious. That's why we have to pay attention. Be like the Bereans. Check the scriptures. Does it fit? If it doesn't, something's wrong. Now, uh, again, here's where I wanted to say did you notice the greetings here from uh, verses 21 through 23 is a little bit different than those from verses 1 through 16? Here is that, that um, the scribe, uh, Tacheris, is now adding his greetings to the people in Rome. And again, was saying that this was quite common and um, um, nothing unusual about that. So, let's go back to 21 and say here, Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, uh, as do Lucius, Jason, Sisipater, and relatives. Now, who is Timothy? Well, we know that Timothy was like a son to uh, Paul. Um, he was on uh, Paul's first uh, missionary journey, got scared, whatever reason, left, and... Um, left him, and it left a sour taste in Paul's mouth or in his uh, attitude towards him. But later on in years, they found that Timothy was a, a tremendous person. In fact, he was a developer right along with Paul, and Paul depended upon him quite a bit. You want to know more about Timothy, 
look at uh, the epistles that uh, Paul wrote to him, to him uh, first and second Timothy, and those letters uh, to to Timothy is what we look at today as um, as the books of administration and discipline. Uh, we also can follow along how we pick our leaders. Uh, we are recently, or we are now in the midst of picking our leaders, and we look at each individual uh, who has uh, been nominated, are they qualified, and th those types of things. And here we can find that Paul is writing to Timothy there and saying, here are the qualifications for your elders and deacons and so on and so forth, and uh, administration too, and how to discipline. But you want to know more about uh, Timothy? Read uh, First and Second Timothy. Then um, uh, Lucius, a fellow kingsman here. Let's get down to him. Um, oh, this is uh, this is possibly the uh, Lucius of Cyrene, a teacher in the church of in Antioch of Syria. And to find him, you can find that one in Acts uh, thirteen one. Uh, he and other leaders uh, possibly had laid their hands on Barnabas and Paul and sent them on their very first uh, uh, missionary journey. So that, that was uh, this particular Lucius. Uh, we look at Jason. Jason is a fellow kinsman, possibly a, a Christian of Thessalonica, uh, who gave uh, lodging to Paul and Silas on that particular missionary journey. And that's found in Acts 17, uh, 5 through 7 and verse 9. And as we look further along, uh, Sisipater is a fellow Christian, possibly the same person in Acts um, chapter 20, verse 4. And, and that's why I say as we look at these things, uh, it, it brings not just a name, but it brings a person a life and there is more to it than just here uh, there it's a real person and who are these people why are they so important to be mentioned and then he, in verse 22 it says um, uh, I meaning himself now he's saying I uh, he is the scribe uh, uh, Tertius uh, who wrote down this letter greet you in the Lord again this is nothing un unusual uh, to have a scribe to write a uh, person dictating and the scribe is writing it down. But it is also not unusual for them to send their personal greetings along with the author of the letter. Then we have um, verse 23. It says, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, send uh, his, uh, you his greetings. Now, Gaius is a common Roman name. And um, there are four different Gaiuses mentioned in the uh, New Testament. And um, we, I, it's hard to say which one, but we do know that he must have been a wealthy man if he was able to uh, handle all of this entourage of Paul about ready to go to Rome. Uh, he had to be quite a wealthy man to be able to do that. Um, as we look at um, Erastus, um, Erastus, it says here, let me get down here, uh, who is the city's director of public works. Now, that is also translated as the city treasurer, by the way. Uh, and so uh, he is a publican. We know that he's high up in official. And that's when I say that when a church first developed, it was for everyone. You could be a high official like uh, this person is, um, Erastus, or you could be a lowly person. Uh, it didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference about Jew or Gentile. It didn't make any difference about Roman or Greek. Uh, everyone was welcomed. Erastus sends his and uh, you their uh, greetings too. Um, then we come to verse 24. And now that is interesting because my Bible, the NIV is one, now this was the one that was uh, uh, 1984 edition. 
Um, the newer ones are not as good as this one. In fact, I'm going to be changing Bibles as soon as I can. And I'm going to go to the Revised King James. I think I like that one a lot better. But verse 24 uh, is not in this Bible. And some Bibles end with verse 24. And that is, is uh, I'm not here to debate why it's there or why it's not. But in some there are, and I want to read verse 24. That's in the King James. Uh, Standard, American Standard has it. Um, other Bibles do, some don't. But it's, what's interesting, the um, King James Version has verse 24, but the Revised King James does not. But here's what verse 24 says. It says, and it reads this way, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. Amen. End of the epistle. Um, but here we see verses uh, 25 through 27 are here. Um, I don't know if this just is a note afterwards or what, but um, we're going to study what is being said and leave it at that. It says, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mysteries hidden for long ages past, about, but now revealed and have been made known through the pathetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and believe him and might be obey and believe him uh, to the only wise God be glory forever through uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, this is Paul's custom. Um, he ends a letter with a, a, a doxology and a the doxology is not only that, uh, just an inscription to, um, to God, but it actually here, it neatly uh, summarizes this entire epistle. And if you look at that, uh, it, it is. It's a summarization of what all the other, all 16 chapters are about. Um, Paul was a tremendous a tremendous apostle, as I've said. And to study him is, is a very complicated man. But I want, to, I want to close by telling this, though, is that Paul sees all the gospel and the proclamation as, uh, as part of God's revelation of his plan. That plan sometimes is called the mystery, or sometimes it's called uh, the strategy. 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 Uh, for the redemption of the world. And this plan has always been known, but only, and it was known and written by the prophets. But it's only now, as he's saying here, is that those, those strategies, that plan, has been known to you, or known to him, and that, um, that uh, it's always been there. And all you had to do is look to find it. Um, there you, uh, you would discover the writings of the prophets. The focus of that plan, as Paul uh, proclaims, uh, as he proclaims it, is the gospel's result. And what is the gospel's result? And that is that all nations might believe and obey him in these last couple of verses here. Paul's writing, as well as Luke's portrayal of Paul in Acts, are uh, consistent in this, that God is now opening his kingdom to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. Paul's gospel uh, has, has been from the very beginning of his ministry a message uh, to all nations, an emphasis that is in perfect harmony with Christ's commission and his commission to his disciples as recorded in the gospels. And I want to end this lesson and this study by reading the Great Commission, and you can see how the study of Paul and all of his writings, and if you look at them, Paul wrote uh, a little more than half of the New Testament. And if you look at that, you can see how prolific of a writer that he was, how dedicated he was. And we, as Christians of today, have benefited 
from his, from his books and his epistles. But listen to what Jesus said, and then we will close this study with that. This is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, and we're going to read um, 18 to the end. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Does that not sound like Paul? He is saying here, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel, and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. That's the writings of the prophets. But now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations, all nations might believe and obey him to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. That is Paul. Till we meet again, uh, may God be with you. And I have to tell you that uh, this will be my last uh, study for a while. Uh, I have to travel to Alaska, and I'll be gone uh, probably for two or three months. Uh, I'll be coming back and forth. I have a lot of business I have to settle up with uh, there. So um, maybe in the winter we can come back and perhaps have another Bible study by me anyway. I don't know what the pastor has in mind, but we haven't discussed that too much. But still, I want uh, everybody to, if you would please, uh, read uh, Acts. That's the history of the, of the church. Uh, if you want to read a very good one in the Old Testament, uh, there's several good ones there too. I happen to like Joshua, which is the... Um, an excellent book about the history of the of the Hebrews. Uh, there are some other very, very fine, in fact, they're all good, but Acts is one of my favorites because it gives us uh, an insight on who people are. Um, read the Gospels. Uh, the best one I like in that one is Mark because Mark, through his Gospel, 90, about 95% of the other, the uh, Synoptic Gospels, anyway, uh, are covered from what Mark has said. So if you want to get a, a, a brief understanding of, of, uh, the, of, J of Jesus, anyway, uh, read Mark. Then drop down to uh, Acts, and then here in Romans, uh, the other books that I think are extremely good, of course, John, you can't help it. John is excellent. Uh, others are good, but those three in particular, it gives you a, a really good idea of how the church was developed, uh, where uh, the Gospels were coming from, and, and who they were written to. Uh, the four Gospels, of course, were written to four different groups of people. And as you study, you'll learn that. Um, it makes us feel more confident in our relationship with God. And the whole idea is a God relationship through the heart. Brain knowledge is fine, but we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. That is where we need to be. I like studying, but there is something that's even more than that. And that as you develop, the more you know, the more you love. And with that, we need to close. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have this time uh, to study your word. Now, Lord, as we close this uh, portion of uh, Bible studies, uh, we will continue on. Pastor and I have not discussed what we will do in the next few months or weeks, but we will have something. And Lord, we ask that you will be with those who are watching, uh, that we will come back to live uh, church again, you know that there is in the process of, of uh, videotaping, even becoming live where we can be scream streaming on uh, YouTube and those areas that Pastor will be doing. But until then, Lord, we just ask that you will bless all the churches who are struggling. 
We ask that you will be continued our blessings on those who are teaching and preaching Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that you will put your protective arms around those who come in contact with this uh, coronavirus. This is a terrible disease. But Lord, we ask that through uh, health uh, reasons and uh, just be common sense is that we protect ourselves too. Uh, Lord, uh, continue to bless this church, all churches. Be with me as I travel uh, back and forth to Alaska to uh, settle some business matters. Lord, uh, just continue to uh, to bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.